welcome to Dignified Resilience. These days, we are all going through challenging times. There is stress, there is uncertainty. For some people, this is the first time a major adversity is hitting them in many unprecedented ways. For many others around the world, uncertainty and loss and trauma and grieving are part of their daily lives already. Yes, there is, and there will be the end of a pre-COVID era, and there will be a post-COVID age as well. But for many people out there, a lot might just stay the same, and that's not a good thing. That is why each of us has a choice now, because, or thanks to this pandemic, to think whether there are things to do differently, how to proceed living, and to decide how to act. So we do what we can and what we think is right in this moment. I say this because one of the several visions I have had for this podcast is to listen to the people and the kind of stories that I myself wanted to hear more of. Voices who I believe deserve to be heard more and to keep discovering them along the way. I wanted to connect. Not to say these platforms have never existed or do not exist, obviously, but there's a certain power and surely responsibility in being the creator and the curator of the content presented with your name next to it. So I took charge. I wanted a community that is a global meeting point to convene, to vent, to comfort, to network, to empower, to encourage, to learn. There is no doubt that this way or another, we've all felt loss and experienced some pain. And so I imagined a sort of convergence point in space, one that could feel like home for those who, without judgment, want to seek and find strength, consolation, resilience, and motivation from the human connections established through these conversations. I wish there was a web of support for those who fight the good fight to feel encouraged through this currency called appreciation. I wish a community that allows connection and growth and mistakes. And for those who are interested in creating a wave, a beautiful ripple effect through vulnerable sharing, sharing hope, sharing fears, sharing pieces of themselves, even through their very presence while being recorded. There is power in it by listening and talking. We get closer to each other. And then we might feel less lonely, even for a moment. That is how we discover and tap into that power. So that imagined space in my head is right now this virtual space of podcasts because of social distancing. But I do want to tell you one thing as well. Regarding this podcast, and like Christian Amanpour said many times, you can expect that I will be truthful, not neutral. She said that taking truth, telling the truth requires taking a side. While covering Bosnian genocide in the 1990s, Amanpour herself was accused of taking the side of the targeted Muslims, not reporting impartially. And recently I read one interview on this topic and I quote her. I learned very, very early on, 30 years ago, now that objectivity does not mean neutrality. Not in Bosnia, when we were faced with the genocide and some expected us to make a moral equivalence on all sides and I refused, point blank. I refused to make a factual or moral equivalence. In my view, when you're dealing with issues like genocide and the violation of international humanitarian law, if you cause a false equivalence and are neutral, you are an accomplice to these crimes. That is why today we will talk about the heartbreaking pain and about the incredible, outstanding, exceptional courage and resilience of Uyghurs who are facing ongoing, widely documented persecution, surveillance, pervasive control, intimidation, <clears throat> forced labor. Today on Mother's Day, so many Uyghurs from around the world sent a collective message to the world and the Chinese government, demanding the immediate release of their mothers. Now, 
before I present my guests, just shortly, for those who might not be familiar, Uyghurs are mostly Muslim ethnically Turkic minority concentrated in China's northwestern Xinjiang region, where they were a majority compared to Han Chinese who are the ethnic majority in the rest of the country. Over the past few years, at least the million Uyghurs, and I have seen numbers much higher than that, going up to three million people, have faced immense pressures and campaigns with the aim of destroying their cultural identity and religious as well. Under pretext of religious extremism and separatism, those who disappear are interned in the so-called re-education re camps, the Chinese government's heavily fortified detention centers. Inmates are forcibly taught Mandarin and instructed in Communist Party propaganda. They are forced to renounce their faith and culture. Dozens of mosques have been destroyed and demolition of cemeteries is ongoing as well. Families are separated for months and years now, if not forever, young children included. These people are kept without any connection with their loved ones. The activists who speak out are intimidated. And these centers are like jails. People are put behind without charges, behind bars without charges, without trial, determined sentencing, with no idea how long they will be imprisoned or whether they will come out alive. The Uyghur's plight is not heard about as much as it needs to be learned about. So we will raise awareness here by understanding why this is happening, how is it manifesting, what is the situation on the ground, and what is the human cost of this incredible cruelty. Learn how the Uyghurs use social media and about their activism, how they stay resilient through their resistance. By talking about the injustice they are experiencing, my aim is to recognize what the grand majority of all of them have always wanted anyway, their dignity, to exist freely in China and in practice to practice their religion accordingly. I'm humbled to have two guests today. One is Nuri Turkad, an attorney in Washington, DC. In addition to law practice, Mr. Turkad serves as chair of the board for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, a documentation-based advocacy organization he co-founded in 2004 and for which he served as executive director until 2006. He also served as president of the Uyghur American Association from 2004 to 2006. He testified before the US Congress and he has given numerous presentations at universities, government institutions, and foreign policy forums in the US and internationally. He has published commentaries on the policy and legal matters in numerous uh, publications such as the Wall Street Journal and foreign policy and has appeared on the major radio and television programs around the world. And my other guest is Samira Emin. She works as a research assistant at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, a Harvard Medical School teaching hospital. She is also a daughter of Emin John Seydin, a prominent Uyghur historian and publisher who owns Xinjiang Emin Book Publishing Company. She is a tireless advocate for her father. Long after she lost trace of her dad, she heard that under charges of promoting and inciting extremism, her father was put under closed trial, was sentenced to 15 years and unlawful imprisonment by the Chinese government, and was deprived of political rights for five years. They will tell us about their stories and about their advocacy and campaigns. Samira's tenacity and advocacy appearances on numerous media platforms kind of worked because very recently, the Chinese state media posed a video of her father. She will tell us more about the current situation and whether she believes he's really free. One thing that I want our listeners to understand is that so many people are currently experiencing the same uncertainty like Samira or Nuri, but so many, just like two of them, continue raising their voices bravely and loudly in demanding freedom for their loved ones. So Nuri and Samira, thank you so much for joining me in Dignified Resilience podcast. I want to tell you and to all our Uyghur listeners, I speak in my personal capacity, but I know many people feel similarly. I'm so sorry for what you're going through 
because it is something that nobody should ever have to experience. I am in awe of your tenacity and incessant advocating for your loved ones. But honestly, I'm not surprised because I'm sure that I would do the same thing if I were in a similar situation. Thank you again. And my first question is, how are you? Nuri, you're uh, here in Washington, DC, I believe. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much. Um, at the outset, I'd like to say happy Mother's Day to you and many other mothers around the world, including my own uh, mother, whom I haven't had a chance to see uh, since 2004. It's been 16 years uh, since I lost her, uh, since I saw her last. And also a uh, mother of my two beautiful children. And importantly, those Uyghur mothers who have been languishing in the Chinese concentration camps, as well as, as, well as those uh, mothers who have been uh, separated from their loved ones, uh, children, uh, even in some instances died in isolation as a result of the ongoing global health crisis. Um, I have been uh, trying to uh, use this lockdown uh, as a, an opportunity to spend more time with my uh, family, uh, try to do uh, mentally, physically healthy things, uh, reading, exercising. Uh, you know, I've seen worse. So, you know, I cannot complain my good conscience that I, I'm locked, locked up or home, uh, staying at home with my family. So all things considered, um, um, it's going okay. Um, uh, we, will, uh, we, will, uh, we will be able to return to uh, some sort of normalcy with a different uh, perspective on life eventually. But um, I, I feel uh, that... Um, uh, during this kind of difficult time, uh, the family, uh, being around family is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, Samira, you, I believe, are in Boston right now, correct? Mm -hmm. How are you doing today? I've been taking day by day. You're also working. Um... Um, well, I would like to thank, thank, say thank you to everyone for, to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Samira. Um, I'm in Boston right now, and the current pandemic is a little bit uh, difficult than what I was expecting. And then um, everyone is trying their best to combat the virus. And then me, as a um, as someone who works in a hospital is also doing my part to, you know, end this uh, thing as early as possible. Thank you so much. You're part of that group of essential workers, I believe, who not only has to deal with your own trauma, but you have to care for us outside. So additional thank you for all that you're doing in that regard. Um, <laughs> Nuri, let's dive into conversation. I will immediately ask a simple question that has no simple and one answer, but to keep it blunt and clear for our listeners who might not be familiar. Why are these people locked up, Nuri? How many people are we actually talking about? Because I've seen numbers from one million to three people. What's going on? Um, different people give a different answers. Uh, some of the policy experts try to link it to China's national security concern. Some academics lay out the policy initiatives being considered, implemented, uh, put in place, uh, and implemented by the Chinese government, particularly the current uh, Chinese uh, leader, uh, Communist Party chairman, uh, Xi Jinping. But uh, to me, as a Uyghur, as a, as a member of this uh, uh, oppressed ethnic minority, uh, ethnic group, um, I believe that has a lot to do with the racism. Um, uh, as I grew up, um, in the Uyghur society and among the Chinese people during my college years, the Uyghur people always been treated as others. So being others, being different is unacceptable. Therefore, we must give up our way of life, tradition, language, religion, to become just one of them. If you stand in a way, I will take you out. That's a kind of a, a method, been quietly promoted, implemented, 
throughout the history, particularly uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, because the Chinese didn't want the uh, East Turkestan region to become another Balkan to create a security concern or uh, threaten China's territorial integrity. So they created this Uyghur enemy uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and of the Cold War, thinking that uh, the Uyghurs may rise up and, and demand uh, sovereignty uh, in that, that piece of pro uh, prosperous and precious uh, territory that the Uyghurs proudly call East Turkestan. So uh, this has been a norm, but there are several um, events uh, somewhat rela uh, related to and facilitated the Chinese uh, authorities to come up with what's called the final solution to a quote unquote Xinjiang problem. Um, since 2005 um, and more recently since 2012, the Chinese authorities uh, uh, domestically building up the surveillance state uh, testing in the inland region and then imp exporting some of those techniques into the Uyghur region and now using the Uyghur lives as a uh, uh, laboratory material. And then uh, uh, globally, they launched this uh, signature project, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, that goes through the Uyghur's homeland in the heart of Central Asia, makes one sixth of the China proper, rich in natural resources, uh, has a long international borders. Basically, it is a gateway to a Eurasian market for the Chinese. So they, they, they just made a calculus. One, the world start to uh, look in the other way when it comes to democratic principles and human rights. And international power is a kind of uh, retrieving from the world stage and creating this vacuum. And also the uh, economic relationship with China becomes so intertwined. The Europeans and Americans uh, kind of letting the uh, Chinese to run, the, uh, run their business uh, in the face of all the uh, uh, ghastly human rights abuses committed against the, uh, the Uyghurs and others. So they, they looked around and, and made a calculus and, and launched this uh, current nightmare-like uh, environment in late 2016 with the uh, appointment of a, a hardliner, um, a very brutal Chinese communist leader uh, who got promoted from his previous position in Tibet to become a party secretary in the Xinjiang government. So since 2000, late 2016, they formulated policies and put in place surveillance apparatus and they come up with the uh, ways to uh, create a massive database for the Uyghurs based on your uh, travel history, uh, past writing in Samira's father's case, publication, uh, being a socially influential individual or custodian of Uyghur ethno-national tradition culture, literature, uh, philanthropist, uh, religious leaders, even in some instances, uh, nationally known athletes, stage for performers caught up in this uh, network of uh, 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 artificial intelligence aided uh, system that the Chinese created. So in early 2017, they start rounding up people initially um, social elites, uh, starting in April 2017, uh, university professors, uh, authors, uh, religious leaders, uh, business leaders, they uh, rounded up literally anyone who can think or express this, their disapprovals through writing or public speaking. So all the social elites are gone. And starting in uh, summer 2017, with the AI uh, uh, powered uh, methods, that they come up with this new system called Integrated uh, Joint Operating Platform, IJOP. Uh, in just one, uh, uh, in a very short period of time, about 10 days, they run up about 20,000 people in just one summer in 2017. So um, to answer your question simply, this is all about racism. Um, it has been evident from the Chinese officials' public remarks. Um, case in point, there's an ambassador uh, representing the Chinese government in Washington. He said on a number of occasions that the Chinese government is helping the Uyghurs to transform into normal human beings. But they failed to understand nowhere in the, in the, in the world, uh, last time I checked their language, their way of life, they're uh, not even believing in anything. as a norm internationally uh, so that people like the Uyghurs and others must adopt. 
So they, they uh, ironically, ridiculously, uh, they're trying to convert the Uyghurs. So that's a code word for a cultural genocide. So there's an active genocidal policy is being implemented uh, in the Uyghurs' ho uh, homeland. Um, you know, so much of what you mentioned to me as a Bosniak sounds so familiar in a way that this so-called eliticide, and I recently posted a, a long thread on it uh, on my social media account, happened in Bosnia as well. When uh, the leaders of the community in, from various professions are systematically exterminated. So what's going on with Samira's father and so many other intellectuals and community leaders that I've learned about Yal Kunrozi, Yar Muhammad, Tahrir Tukluk, Ilham Toti, the winner of the European Parliament's 2019 Sakharov Prize, Freedom of Thought, and so many of them who are now sentenced um, often in, to life in prison for separatism charges. I think it's something that is not unfamiliar and that is very troubling. Samira, thank you again for joining us. I mean, what is the latest situation with your father in particular? Um, I think I forgot to mention that the transition uh, that happened in my life, I would like to say that to begin with. Um, so I was a student when I came to the Amer come, come to the US. Um, I chose uh, biology and psychology as my major. Uh, and then as a pre-med, I, you know, aim to become a medical professional in the future. And then after my graduated, a graduation, um, I started working, as you mentioned, um, at, at one of the Harvard Teaching Hospital as um, clinical research assistant. Um, there were, there were not um any other duty or burden other than my uh, uh school or work uh and i was hoping to you know go back home at some point to uh, reunite with my family and uh hopefully find a find a job there but uh when i found out about my father's missing uh my life has i would say completely changed um and I had a new mission, new mission in life, which is to uh, look for my father uh, and protect him, uh, protect his all rights as he uh, did when I was little. And um, recently I was informed about um, his uh, recent development uh, not by himself, but by the state-run China Daily. Uh, it was a testimony video featuring my father. And then the video says that I was deceived by the anti-China anti force into thinking that my dad was illegally detained. Uh, but in fact, my dad, um, you know, it was living a peaceful life back home and in the video he also asked me to stop my camping and go back to to visit them or find a job there um after i finish my school mm. seeing my dad in such video came as a shock to me that i couldn't click the video to see um what my dad was forced to say like right away um, it took me a while and also I would like to mention that um, there have been many examples like this before with uh, other people they would often um, ask family members overseas to stop being active. I have read so many testimonies or posts by Uyghurs who are demanding and who are hoping to even see a glimpse of this sort of video because so many of them are still unsure uh, whether their parents, siblings, or cousins are even alive. But I think it's a 
as much as it's comforting, I still, it's, I feel it's still, I can imagine how troubling it might be to not know how true this is because you can't just call him again, right? You have to just wait for him to somehow get in touch with you. Am I correct? Um, yes and no, but uh, so far so good. We were able to communicate with each other uh, for the past couple of days, but I do hope that this will continue. Mm -hmm. Nori, um, if the political situation deteriorates, it could impede even coronavirus response. Can you tell us what's going on over there? I mean, China calls Muslims faith a virus to justify suppression of Uyghurs, it calls even Hong Kong protests a political virus. What is it that you know is going on in terms of pandemic situation right now? Um, it, it is ironic. I'm so glad that you raised that um, uh, interesting question. Uh, early on, uh, the Chinese, uh, through you know the leaked documents that we have uh, been able to uh, uh, read and find out about the um, the official narrative, uh, even before the, uh, the the New York Times and uh, and other revelations being um, uh, made public, the Chinese government was calling the Uyghur religion as the uh, uh, thought virus. And now, uh, when the Western governments, especially the United States, even try to use the word the Wuhan virus, uh, they feel offended and try to play the the racism card. So how ironic, how insecure this government is, including the way. Uh, you know, people like to say uh, this is a general perception of China, a powerful country, strong country. This strong country, a powerful country, would not use family fam members against each other. Uh, it shows how insecure this government is. I feel like they are cornered. And I feel um, that, uh, and I, this is actually, it's, it's been proven that the more people like Samira and others speak out, telling the human story, putting a human face on the larger Uyghur persecution. Uh, more people will sympathize and learn about it. At the same time, the Chinese people, Chinese government will have a hard time to justify linking this to some sort of national security concern. So the coronavirus, uh, uh, the ongoing pandemic uh, to Chinese government's benefit, diverted the world's attention. But I think I, I'm confident that that, that we will come back to this. Because the, the, there's only so much that the Chinese can portray a rosy picture and show Potemkin villages and continue with this uh, disinformation um, campaign, misinforming the public. They can only go so far. Now we know you cannot believe in or trust in the Chinese government. They not only cover up, they can create much larger problems. Like this is one of the moments that my Uyghur friends have been telling people like, I told you so. Hmm. And Nuri, we know that large groups of Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities have been, have been confined together in very cramped quarters. Um, do we know what is the situation in particular with the virus in these concentration camps? The Chinese government's official statistics should be taken off or deleted from the worldwide pandemic statistics because it's not trustworthy. Um, ironically, after the January uh, uh, the lockdown of China or Chinese cities. Uh, there's unconfirmed news reports that large number of Chinese uh, individuals traveled to the Uyghur region, but the official figure only shows 76 confirmed cases and three deaths. It's incredible. It's, uh, it, it, it is no way that anyone with the right mind could believe in that kind of uh, statistics. What we have been unable to confirm um, is if this virus made it uh, to the camps. The camps are already overcrowded, uh, inadequately, uh, you know, uh, uh, housed like people are, are living in a very uh, poor uh, hygiene condition. Uh, malnutrition has been reported that people who came out managed to come out, come out of the uh, camps. The camp survivors told us that people are losing weight and, and not being able to have a decent meal. Um, so, so the situation was already bad. And if this virus made it to the camps, 
we would have, we would, uh, it would be unthinkable. Um, I don't even want to think about what will happen to the people uh, in the camps. And also, um, one of the most disturbing things we will, uh, I'm sure that you will, uh, you will, um, we will delve into this question a little bit more in details. But since the break, uh, the outbreak uh, in January, the the China's economic engine uh, has stopped functioning. So people are staying home. So what the Chinese government uh, doing, based on credible reports uh, that has been published by the uh, Radio for Asia and others, that they uh, for uh, transferring the Uyghur youth, both from the society and camps to the coastal cities, uh, where they will be forced to perform uh, labor. And um, some of those multinational corporations uh, profiled by the Australian think tank ASPE uh, uh, recently. Uh, over 80, 83 companies who, who have been uh, either wittingly or unwittingly assisting the Chinese state and as well as been using uh, the uh, forced labor to taint global uh, supply chain. The global uh, uh, economic environment was polluted even before we're dealing with the ongoing health crisis. And let's also mention that, you know, a couple of days ago, it was World Press Freedom Day on May 3rd. And China has quite abysmal record on so many related fronts. Um, yeah. That it's very unfortunate that they are tightening even more kind of the media and speech freedoms regarding the reporting on the plight of the Uyghurs. It makes it much more difficult for us to get information of what's really going on there. But another thing that I wanted to ask you, Nuri, is that right now, as Muslims around the world observe an unprecedented holy month of Ramadan this year due to the coronavirus pandemic, Uyghur Muslims are not allowed to do fasting or to practice their religion while being locked up. Um, do you know, I mean, is it true that in practice Xinjiang has only ever been autonomous in name? Like, how, what was the situation before? Because from what I've read, people have been locked out even just for having a beard, for having m more kids, uh, you know, four kids instead of three kids, for wearing a Muslim religious, um, you know, clothing for women. How and what is the consequence of the restriction of religious freedom, particularly in this holy month for Muslims around? Chinese government, uh generally see the Uyghur um, uh, ethno-national identity, particularly uh, religious practices, as a sign of disloyalty to the Communist Party. Um, it's been almost two decades that they have been heavily focusing on restriction of Uyghur religious practices. Um, back in 2005, some human rights organizations and government entities uh, recognized that there has been, there was a uh, uh, systematic, deliberate, wholesale attack on the Uyghur Islam. But the 9-11 changed that uh, landscape and then um, began to this uh, Middle Eastern conflict. And then uh, their, their Islamophobia is on the rise around the world. Uh, that given the Chinese government a better talking point, a better position. So, um, uh, as you pointed out perfectly, we've gone through a very um, uh, uh, unusual uh, Ramadan uh, this year. Um, I hear my, my fellow Muslim friends uh, complaining uh, that they could not go to the mosque or they cannot you know, socialize families and friends as they do traditionally. But this has been the norm for the Uyghur people at least a decade. A um, few years ago, uh, we start seeing the Chinese forcing a very conservative Uyghur woman drinking beer in public uh, during the month of Ramadan, forcing the Uyghur uh, shop owners, uh, butchers, uh, restaurant owners to keep the restaurant open. Uh, so, and also banning the students, um, government employers, even those who are retired from practicing Islam uh, or fasting during the month of Ramadan. So this was already a horrific, even before they created this nightmare uh, situation for the Uyghurs. But now since 2000, this is very important, uh, April 2017, the local uh, government uh, legislated something called de-extremification measure. 
they sanction some of the most acceptable behaviors. Uh, something is sign of uh, extremism, growing beard, naming children with Islamic names, Fatima, Mohammed, uh, even Yasin, you know, every the like, uh, Quranic names have been banned. And also um, adhering to halal diet based on this April 1, 2017 regulation is also a sign of extremism. And most importantly, there's something uh, very important in Uyghur lives. The Uyghur uh, uh, family, because of our tradition, because of a cultural uh, 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 the adherence to Islamic faith-based values, uh, Uyghurs generally don't marry uh, people who are not Muslim which is perfectly respectful, understandable. There is only, I, I probably know one or two people in my entire adulthood, adult, adulthood life uh, who are uh, married to Han Chinese. So, so this intermarriage uh, is very, very rare. But in the societies that you and I live, um, it's, if you say, oh, people should only marry their own ethnic group, it sounds racist. But when you're facing uh, an existential threat, the female population is the, the most vulnerable, vulnerable population that you need to protect. The Uyghur parents know this very well. And in, the, in this 2017 regulation, they specifically criminalized what targeted Uyghur parents with a, a very specific provision. It says, you cannot interfere in your children's love affairs with non-Muslim, non-Uyghur individuals. And now, they forcing Uyghur women to marry Han Chinese with a threat that if they don't marry, they either will be uh, punished or sent to the camps because they have extremist thoughts or the parents who are up, uh, uh, objecting will face consequences. So even that kind of basic social norms, if it's based on the love and affection, so be it. But if it's based on the government policies with a genocidal intent that it is not acceptable. So, um, so, so not only the, the normal uh, course of religious practices were banned, but religion-based social values, cultural values were criminalized. Well, it's, and it still uh, has been a practice. I think that hearing you say those things again, I it rings so much bell to what's ha what has happened in Bosnia as well, in terms of similar accounts of systematic torture and rape and forced sterilization programs that I read about, forced marriages, like you say, of Uyghur women to Han Chinese men, forced adoptions of Uyghur children to Han Chinese families. I mean, this is so painful because um, Bosnian women have endured similar kind of sexual violence and yeah. crimes against humanity. So I think- Can I make one quick comment on that? I, I you know, this, it, the, the irony is that we've seen how it ends when the people with the influence and power look the other way as it happened to Bosnian people. Um, the, the examples that I was giving you is people are free and relatively free, will live outside of the camps. But inside of the camps, we've been hearing horrific sexual violence, for sterilization, like controlling women's uh, uh, menstruals with uh, pills. Uh, the, one of the survivors who were here in Washington testified in Congress, told uh, what she had gone through. And one of the survivors who were in Washington, um, Zumret Dawood, was said on the same panel last September in New York on the sideline, in a sideline event organized by the State Department, told the audience with the more than 30 uh, 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 diplomats from, uh, the U uh, uh, from the United Nations that she could not, uh, she cannot, can no longer conceive a child because of what she had gone through in the concentration camp. I think that Samira, one of the things that I have read in many powerful interviews um, that a talented reporter Aisha Khan did with you, I think, is that in one interview I read you commented how some people say that you're so brave and your father will be so proud of you. And mm. you responded, he gave me life, he educated me, 
and he made me the person who I am today. So this is basic. Mm -hmm. Would you elaborate on that a little bit? I think that was so, it made me think of my father. I saw a little bit of my own love for him and I could understand you, but how, how does that feel? You said, this is my duty. Yeah. Um, to me, my family is everything and my parents raised me up to be the person who I am today. Um, as they have always loved me and showed me how to love by their action, um, I be always believe that it is my duty to love them, care for them, and uh, protect them from uh, any injustice um, and adversity that are, that they're facing, that they face. Um, so this is why I think uh, what I've done for my father is a basic thing that a kid uh, should do for his or her uh, parents. Um, and um, that is the least we can do as kids. Mm -hmm. Cause they, cause parents have dedicated their whole life to your growth, like to, to your education. You know, they try their best. And um, I think uh, if I don't do anything and just sit there and wait for magical magic to happen, um, it's, it just can't, I can't. Mm -hmm. My aim is to shed light to the human cost of this cruelty. I think when we all, discuss policies and strategies and hard facts on any issue, it is absolutely important. That's kind of a roadmap that allows us to move forward. But I think that the human cost of the catastrophes of genocide, of these crimes against humanity, is something that we need to keep more out there in the media so people understand. And I've watched dozens of videos posted on social media by Uyghur activists uh, from the diaspora, from around the world. And it was just so clear how simple the source of that emotional resilience stems from the most humane thing, love. Love for the family, love for the parents, for the siblings who are innocent and put in these camps without any news without any information of what would happen to them. I think, Nuri, I think in estimates vary, but I've learned that there is between 1,000 and 15,000 Uyghurs currently residing in the US. A majority of them, I believe, live in the DC area. Um, is that true? And can you tell us what are you doing as individuals and community? Um, how do you stick together in these tough times? Um, based on the research, uh, research uh, recent research conducted by the Uyghur Human Rights Project, um, uh, uh, depending, uh, relying on the government statistics, U.S. government statistics, there are about 8,000 Uyghurs living in the United States. But um, are they all politically active? Uh, traditionally, no. But now, uh, because of this um, uh, brutal treatment of everyone, literally everyone, whether you have political history or not, whether you're just minding your own business, uh, staying non-political. Uh, even in an instance, some Uyghurs try to stay out of the Uyghur area, even the Washington area, to avoid getting into conflict with the Chinese government. It didn't work. So they turned the entire Uyghur American community into a vibrant uh, political activist community. Uh, this has been uh, very effective uh, compared to other countries. People like uh, Samira uh, effectively utilize social media in multiple languages um, and uh, extremely effective. And the Uyghur is very uh, strategic and effective advocacy, especially in the U.S. Congress, been noted. Uh, a few months ago, there was a press conference organized by the uh, uh, Congressional Executive Committee on China, 
the members of Congress who were representing the new report, the annual report, noted the whole room was full of Uyghurs holding their loved ones' pictures. And also some of those uh, victims, including Samira, have been regularly visited uh, the US Congress, uh, telling their family stories uh, and, and put a face on the tragic situation. That may have been a direct result of the US Congress, uh, particularly being so vocal, so active. Uh, you may have heard this uh, back in December 3rd, when the US House of Representatives voted on the Uyghur bill, the US Congress was fighting tooth and nail about the impeachment. And yet over 400 members of Congress, including those who are fighting about the impeachment issue on the impeachment issue and the Senate Intelligence Committee and Foreign Affairs Committee came together, uh, uh, voted out this Uyghur bill uh, with more than 400 uh, votes in a Congress with 435 members. So this is, this is a type of environment largely created uh, by the Uyghur American community. The Uyghur American community, uh, you know, as far as the numbers are concerned, very small compared to other expat communities. Some reason they managed to uh, uh, learn how to navigate, navigate the halls of the US Congress and the executive branch. We enjoy enormous uh, support from the US government uh, because of um, the activities that I was describing to you. And also, um, the Uyghur organizations, including the one that I co-founded uh, 16 years ago and the Uyghur American Association has been a, a rallying force. One is in charge of uh, uh, the community. The UHRP is uh, charged with uh, research and documentation. Uh, some of our products have been uh, used and cited by the human rights reports published by both Congress and administration. So this has been a systematic effort uh, that I hope the other Uyghur communities in Australia, Canada, and Europe uh, could utilize and follow. Um, as we speak, there are three pieces of legislation in the U.S. Congress been considered. Uh, one on export control, one is the General Policy uh, Act that may be uh, put on voting uh, soon, and also there's another one on the forced labor. Uh, on top of that, in the executive level, the um, Commerce Department blacklisted over 22 dozen Chinese entities, including the entire police department uh, in the region, in the entity list. And also they imposed a visa sanction uh, on the Chinese officials, uh, unnamed Chinese officials, interestingly. So there's some positive things that are happening, but as a society, I think uh, most people are still switch, uh, sleeping at the switch. I've seen some very creative um, ways in campaigns through social media, and I've learned of Arslan Hidayat, I believe, an activist from diaspora in Australia who's kind of a community leader and um, organizing campaigns uh, like Here Uyghurs, Show Them All, Still No Info, China Show Them All, Google Uyghurs, me to Uyghur, stand with Uyghur, etc. kind of using that power of social media to raise awareness and some very creative ways. Um, Samira, you last night, I believe, posted a very touching, beautiful post on your Twitter account uh, about Mother's Day. Mm -hmm. You did it beautifully. Thanks. How is that? What is that song? Is that a famous Uyghur song that mm -hmm. you, that, that, kind of everybody knows is it a lullaby or what what, what was it um it's a song by a famous Uyghur uh, singer uh Abdullah Tariyam and uh, it's about mother you know Anna a mother I think it's a newly it, it just came out new, um, newly this year uh, maybe February it's a beautiful song and my mom's uh, favorite artist is uh, Abdullah Abdirim, that person, that singer. That's why I chose that song. And also um, the lyrics are very beautiful. And also I think it fits well with the current um, situation as well. That's why I picked that song to um, 
show some support and also say uh, happy Mother's Day and for uh, people all around the world to to listen to this beautiful Uyghur song on this beautiful day. Riada, you mentioned about the, uh, you know, um, you know, people think this, uh, you mentioned about the effect of the, uh, the crisis in our lives. Um, you know, most of us have relatively comfortable living, you know, finishing school, uh, establishing profession. We're supposed to be enjoying uh, basics of life, right? You know, to be able to call you mom and dad, yeah, you know, checking up with them. A few years ago, that was the norm. Even though we know that, you know, cyber police is monitoring your phone calls, you know, looking for sensitive stuff to punish your loved ones. But not even that has been taken away from us. Like in the holidays, like, because I hate holidays. I supposed to enjoy holidays. Like all the major holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and, and now the, uh, we're missing, we're missing out. Um, it got to the worst point, which is, if something happens to vast majority of the Uyghur families today, no one would know. Um, uh, the president of the World Uyghur Congress has been tweeting uh, about his mother today, that he found out about his mother's death several months after she died in the camp through Radio Free Asia broadcast. So, you know, what kind of life is that? It's a thanks, you know, it's a family holiday. You just sit with a long face, um, you don't seem to be interested, uh, you cannot even call your mom to say happy birthday, happy Mother's Day in a day, today, days like this. Every day should be a day that you should be able to call the people who brought you to this world. It's the basic stuff. And not even that kind of uh, basic freedom have been taken away from uh, us. So it's been enormously difficult. And, and, the, and the problem is, um, I, you know, I said this in my testimony in Congress that I, it would be disingenuous for me to say that I have a normal life. I don't. How could I have a normal life? You know, materialistic and that, everybody has, you know, no one is hungry. Uh, everybody has a roof over their head, but that's not it. You know, there's something else in life. There's a thing called dignity. There's a thing called love. There's a thing called respect. You know, there's the, all of the main things that makes your life more fulfilling is missing. So this is largely because of what the Chinese are doing. This, this government knows exactly. They are like, you know, they pick up people um, like Samira's father, apparently very close relationship with her. And they put him in front of a camera. I'm glad that he's alive. He's he, even though he had, does not look well, but he's, I'm glad that he's alive. But he's using a family member against another family member in light of their close relationship. It has happened to me and others as well. So it's been horrific. It, you know, it, I, I, I usually uh, don't have a difficulty to describe a situation or a thing or, or two, but I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I could not come up with a better word to describe the dilemma, the anxiety, the sense of guilt, the despair, hopelessness that we all experience. Stories in the media, we need to keep the plight of the Uyghurs out there. We need to hear these stories. We need to create platforms and we need to amplify the voices of those who are out right now or those who share their stories and kind of not just to learn, but again, the aim, my aim with this podcast is kind of to create a compassionate mind shift among people. A compassionate mind shift. You know, I hear and I read a lot myself about the benefits of mindful compassion. And I myself, I'm thinking we need to think about compassionate mind shifts. And that is why I think through these intimate conversations, we can hear about other people. And then we can hopefully have some self introspection about what we can do. And there are things we can do, right? I, I think that. Um, there are some ways besides uh, learning and amplifying the voices. Are there more concrete ways about uh, people, Nuri, maybe calling their representatives or educating themselves or donating? What do you um, Well, there's several things as a citizen, as a government, as an entity. I mean, there, are, uh, there are many actors in this. This is no longer just a matter of concern for the Uyghur people. Uh, this is, the, this is you know, I say this more than once, 
this is about us. You know, we should not let the authorities and dictatorship or governments like the Chinese government to test the resolve and conscience of the civilized world. And those of us who live in a free world, we should use our freedom uh, to speak for those millions of Uyghurs been languishing in the modern day concentration camps or been subjected to modern slavery. It's, it's simple, it's, it, it's no brainer. And, to, and, and, and also for the government, um, the business as usual has to end. Uh, and I, I worry after the, um, the COVID uh, crisis, I worry that the governments will return to business as usual mode. This tough talk, you know, uh, revisiting the supply chain and dependence on the Chinese mask and um, uh, the medical equipment. I hope that will be even eventually become a, a concrete policy initiatives. And also as a society, um, I'm no, uh, by no means I'm promoting anything against a Chinese people. This is, this is pretty easy um, that uh, we should use what we have uh, at our disposal. At least grab a phone, uh, the call, I mean, grab the phone and make a phone call to your representative at least to uh, have your senator or members of Congress to endorse this legislative in initiative. Call the White House and ask them to Im uh, impose global Magnitsky sanction. The very purpose of the global Magnitsky sanction is to go after abusive government officials that have been responsible for ghastly human rights abuses. This, this kind of tool cannot be uh, in a situation of cherry picking. The administration, have been uh, imposing global, uh, global Magnitsky sanction GMA on some individuals in some countries and reserving it and on, on the others. Um, so the public pressure works. The fact that the Chinese, even the Chinese government compelled to show proof of life video of uh, Samir's father has a lot to do with the public pressure. Of course, no government will acknowledge that I am doing this in light of so-and-so's pressure, but you know, the public discussion, uh, the, the, the conversation that we're having here, public advocacy, citizen activism, government's collective individual actions, um, uh, legislation, and now that people talking about uh, lawsuits, but that's a separate uh, topic for another day, but there has to be a whole holistic approach to tackle this. If, if people continue to feel indifferent unrelated about what's happening, this may affect the lives of all of us. Because at the end of the day, Chinese government has a very specific objective. They try to create a new norm, one. And two, they are actively exporting their way of um, denigrating, uh, uh, re uh, 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 creating a new, new uh, system that is threat to free speech privacy and democratic norms. So at the end of the day, this will affect everybody's life. It, it sounds cliche, but we've seen it. Um, last April, New York Times reported uh, at least two dozen countries around the world already uh, looking to the Chinese model. Look at Hungary, look at Poland. Um, this guy who's, uh, who's, the, the, who's the, uh, the prime minister of Hungary used to be a democracy activist. Now he's very close to the Chinese government. This is, you know, we have to we have to wake up to this brutal reality. Yeah, and one thing that seems quite obvious, Samira, is that Uyghurs and activists, and they will not give up on raising their voices. I think that with no feedback, and the more there is no feedback, they will just step up their advocacy. Am I correct? Very resilient. Yes, I would say so. Um, I think we would in general were pretty resilient, to be honest. Uh, it also varies from person to person, but in general, uh, I do feel like this is a common feature. And also, we all, we all believe in one thing, which is that our all of our family members are innocent. So we have to keep it up. Although we, and don't, also although we don't hear like anything from uh, the Chinese government from that side, like right away, we, we keep it up. Mm -hmm. Rita, can um, I share a story about the, uh, the activism? Um, a couple of years ago, um, one of the Uyghur victims approached me um, and asked uh, if 
it will be safe for him to advocate on behalf of his, his detained father. I said, you know, they, there's this kind of, uh, you know, public fight against this brutal regime comes with a risk. Um, uh, but it can be very empowering uh, work experience. It make you feel like you're doing something to protect your loved ones. So um, try it. And then he's happier. Uh, he said that he recently took, called me and said he's happier than the time that he was uh, sitting on his hand and biting his tongue. So it's empowering. You know, if you don't speak out uh, for on behalf of your loved ones, um, you know, your existence in this world can be, you know, meaningless. I, I, I am a, I'm a stranger. I'm, I like to tell like it is, but you know, I, I, I salute people like Samira and others who've been a uh, tireless advocate, at least uh, on behalf of their uh, family members. One thing that I saw that Samira posted, I can't remember when, which I thought was just so beautiful, and you thanked your followers, Samira, online. You thanked the community, and you said how that has helped you so much to endure sleepless nights, to mm -hmm. endure anxiety. And I think it is important to reiterate this connection that we are making right now and hopefully that uh, our listeners can kind of catch and there is a purpose why i do video uh, of this podcast because i want to be seen i want the human connection uh, between us and the listeners to be um out there um as as kind of an an offering so um that 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 meant to me when i saw you thank uh, your community. I, I felt appreciated and I appreciate you. Yeah. Um, and I said, I meant it, like, you know, I, I meant it because, because of everyone's support, my father's case had a chance to uh, be known more publicly and uh, more people get involved. Um, and without, without these people's support, I don't think um, uh, I, th I don't think the Chinese government would think, oh, let's make a video of his dad. Um, apparently, uh, public support and, uh, and uh, social pressure, like the public's international pressure uh, has helped. So that's why I, I, I truly um, was appreciating whoever was very, being supportive of me. Mm -hmm. And that's why we are here today. Um, I do really believe and I see there is so much support and as I said, people who want to help but feel they're powerless. So I'm glad that Nuri also mentioned kind of a glimpse of what's going on and what people can do concretely uh, to feel uh, and to contribute. Now, I shortly want to ask simply what do you hope happens as soon as possible? Nuri. I, you know, a few things, you know, the Uyghurs are facing an existential threat. Um, there is a long-term, short-term goal, uh, politically, societally. Uh, but, you know, we're sitting in a time bomb, a ticking time bomb. Um, documentary, in the recent uh, PBS documentary, if a Chinese official, uh, security official were interviewed and he said that we fooled the, Chi uh, the Uyghurs uh, telling them that we will re-educate them, they all gone mad. If you release them, they will become social criminals. What we need is a mental hospital. So that's what will happen. They're not going to release the people. If, if their method, the conversion therapy, the human engineering fails, they may cause a physical harm. This is why they have uh, so many uh, crematoriums built around the camps. This is not a news. Radio Phasia reported this at least two years ago. But what is, I think, in my hope should happen is that uh, the global uh, leadership, uh, the leaders around the world from the democracies and civil societies come together, much like the ones that we've seen in history, particularly during the Cold War, um, a collectively tackle this threat. Uh, so those are the things that I think should happen, but none of this would happen without external pressure. The United States government should uh, uh, pass these three legislations as soon as possible. 
uh, let that implement and also sanction those government officials under the uh, under the global Magnitsky Act. Uh, that would be ideal. Uh, the Uyghurs uh, facing existential threat. This has to be tackled. The, the, the crimes committed against Uyghur people has to be stopped. And also one other thing that, that could be done easily, relatively easier, as I pointed out, the global supply chain, the global business environment has been polluted. The business communities have to come out and stop their collaboration with the communist state. And also the investors, including the teachers union in the United States, stop investing in the Chinese surveillance technology. As you know, those of us uh, who are students of history know very well that during the Nuremberg tri uh, 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 trials, not only the uh, Nazi soldiers, but also the industrialists who aided and abated the Nazi Germany were also held responsible. So this is a much bigger problem. If we don't make the Chinese feel that they feel the pinch or feel the pain economically, you will not be able to force, their, uh, force them to change their behavior. Samira, what do you want besides, of course, having your dad with you as soon as possible? Um, my hope, my hope, my hope for the for Uyghur population in in the Uyghur region in China uh, is very simple. Um, I wish everyone there can live peacefully with their family. You know, and um, everyone shares equal, equal, equal human rights. That's very basic that I'm asking, and uh, equal rights that all the all the rest of the you know Chinese people have on their hand. Um, I just want them to um, very simple to live a normal life. I I, I think that's not a lot to ask. Yeah. Hope that these severe restrictions of freedoms of expression and movement stop mm -hmm. as soon as possible like you voiced and then all the friends and family become reunited as soon as possible. And then you get to speak your language freely and practice religion accordingly. Like something right. called five sweet questions at the end um, so that we don't talk about this we talk about something else that brings us closer as well i am going to pose a question and then i would kindly ask both of you to respond and it's really interesting how different people give different answers so understand it as you wish i think um first question for both of you once the current emergency is over what would you not want to forget Nuri. I, you know, I would, um, I would like to remind myself of every day after this is over, uh, some of the basic things that I took it for granted uh, in the past. Um, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a traveler by nature. Um, I, I am, uh, all of my summer travel plans have been interrupted. Um, that's one thing that I, I, I like air traveling. Now it's, you know, I don't know when that will be returned to the normalcy that we used to have. It may not be uh, returned to the way that it was ever. Uh, so I, it, this, this whole thing appreciates me, uh, makes me to appreciate life more. So this, would, this is something that I will be reminding myself of uh, every day going forward, hopefully. Hopefully. Uh, Samira? Um, one thing that I would like to remind myself and not to forget is um, kind of similar to Nuri's, but also that um, try to say what's on your mind to whoever is close to you, like right away. Don't hold on to it because you might not have a chance. Mm -hmm and really cherish whatever is like in front of you and, and the person that you're close with, close, yeah. And then also um, parents, friends, um, greet them often, try your best, keep them close.
-hmm. Thank you. Hi. The next question, um, Nuri, which of your personality traits has been the most useful? Not the best trait, but which one do you think has been most useful? Optimism, uh, you know, try, you know, the way that try to make the best of the circumstance. Um, you know, in the last couple of months, I've, I've been um, utilizing the time that I have uh, to catch up with my reading, um, getting more exercise, uh, to the extent getting more sleep. So focusing on the negative is not going to do anything. So trying to utilize, you know, when will you have two months, right? Maybe even longer every day that you manage your own time, right? Like it doesn't happen like that. So, you know, the, the optimism, uh, because my, uh, I, I think Samira will uh, agree, the Uyghurs have a very unusual life experience. We have seen a lot of unusual things, you know, this may have helped me to, to see the things a little differently, uh, even in a difficult circumstances like this. So um, I think the optimism, uh, trying to make the best out of, um, best of what I have, not what I wanted to have. We should hang out more. I always need more optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Amira. Uh, in my case, I would say uh, resilience and then also uh, learning from the uh, difficult situations and uh, try to you know find motivations in things um, I don't know but it, I, I feel like it's in my personality so that's what I do most of the times um, just like what I did back in college like uh, there was one semester I I took only 12 credits and I, I couldn't do well. I was like, no, this is not gonna happen. And I took 20, 20 credits at one time, the next semester, and then mastered that semester's courses. So I think the example kind of tells. Um, which, I think Nora, you touched upon this, but with, when you have 30 minutes of free time, how do you pass it? Um, you know, I am lucky. I have a very um, um, delightful son uh, who likes to spend time with me. Um, so, and he's a uh, he's passionate about basketball. So, I would like to shoot a hoop with him uh, outside of our house. Um, that thirty minutes would be valuable, just chasing the ball with him in the current circumstance, current situation. But also, I've been spending. Um, uh, at least, you know, half an hour uh, every day checking up with uh, friends who are in a, a less, uh, you know, relatively difficult situation. Um, you know, the, the, because of the job, economics and health situation. So that is also helping me to keep up. That helps me to remind that, look, I could be worse. So you should be um, happier with what you have. So yeah, I I I am lucky that I have um, I have um, have a son at home <laughs> um, mm -hmm. to spend time with. Yeah, um, Samira, what do you do if you have free time? I said thirty minutes, of course, but it's it's a it's a metaphorical <laughs> time is relative at this point today. Uh, hobby wise, if I have free time, of course, singing, as you can see, uh, that cheers me up and uh, makes me forget about everything that is, you know, unpleasant in life. Uh, but um, if, if I if if I have a friend who call um, right on right during that 30 minutes free time. I'm, I'm very willing to like listen to their story and then I try my best to be their um, emotional support. Uh, in my life, my friends have always, have always uh, come to me for such support. So I guess um, I'm not that bad at it. So uh, that's one of the things that I'm uh, willing to do on top of, uh, you know, spending time, some, a long time uh, myself singing. 
Mm. Oh yeah, the, the beautiful singing. Well, I do want to say you should check out this podcast called Dignified Resilience. And the stories are amazing. The, the other <laughs> guests before and upcoming ones kind of seem like you might appreciate um, their stories as well. But um, that joke aside, Nuri, what skill or craft would you like to master? Um, you know, I never thought that uh, video editing, sound editing, uh, setting up proper lights, um, video equipment is something that I needed. Uh, that's something that I'm developing new hobby, uh, video editing. I like to be able to edit, edit videos. And, Which you know, uh, you use? Tell me, advise me. I, I, I'm, I'm figuring it out, but I've learned how to set up the proper lighting uh, and sound system. You know, our life will be very different. I think that uh, going forward, we'll do a lot of video conferences, which is kind of efficient, you know, uh, in some instances. So um, as a lawyer, I cannot uh, practice law by being on a video all the time, but this is something that's very helpful for my uh, public advocacy work, uh, policy discussion, media interviews. So yeah, uh, that's one area that I like to develop. And our listeners cannot obviously see it, but I really like Nuri's background, guys. It is different. It's not just the bookshelf, but it's it's a very <laughs> balanced. The colors are beautiful and it's very stylish too. So Thank good you. job, good job, Nuri. Uh, Samira, how about you? What skill or craft would you like to master? Um, can I say? making Uyghur dishes better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, although I grew up eating these foods, but it's quite difficult to make. And um, it is also delicious, but um, that's one of the things that I want to be, uh, want, want to master in. I want to be a good chef <laughs> in my own dish and also some other, other cooking as well. Um, that's one of my hobby too, like cooking. So mm. that's I what I think course, And food is such a great part of culture. I yeah. think that, you know, mm -hmm. preserving that tradition as well is important uh, for all of us throughout the generations. Um, Samira, so you mentioned your friends and they come to you. So the last question is related to friends actually. Are any of your friends completely opposite to you? Or are most of them similar to you? Hmm. I have all kinds of friends, you know, uh, and I, I think it's a good part that um, people don't, you know, they they don't run away from me, although I can't be different from them. And uh, it maybe shows that I, I, I'm pretty open to all kinds of personalities and uh, uh, all that as long as you're sincere as long as you're kind i have a good heart and a good good heart for humanity and also some some basic principles that i have if you if you uh meet those then uh, I, i'm i'm very open to have friends with all different um characteristics and uh, personalities mm -hmm. what about you nori i um common um you know i people generally are very similar in many aspects, but um, I feel that um, talking to my friends every day, you know, different people, different um, on the different topics. Um, I find that um, the, the one aspect, turning the most undesirable situation, uh, trying to turn that into the advantage is something that I find that I find to be a little bit, um, uncommon uh, comparison to compare to my friends because of my professional training i deal with uh, unexpected circumstances challenges in every day uh, as someone who's trained to be a problem solver you know the other name for attorneys you know i'm not trying to uh, uh, exaggerate what i do for a living but um uh, i i don't dodge problems i tackle the problem that's what i find dealing talking to my friends most recently since I have some time to do that um, so dealing with a problem uh, tackling the problem instead of dodging the problem is something that I find somewhat different compared to my friends well 
thank you so much for this insight. I truly appreciate um, getting to know a little bit, uh, you know, the guests on my podcast. It always makes me curious for more, but it leaves a space for that connection because I will write an email to Samira in a couple of weeks, if not days, to see how's the cooking going. And I will, I have your number, Nuri, now. So, you know, we will, we will talk about that. I do, I think this brings us to uh, the end time-wise as well. Um, before we sign off and thank our listeners, is there anything kind of last minute that you would like to add? Uh, I'd like to I'd like to thank you uh, for um, giving us the opportunity to shed a light on the almost forgotten story. Um, the Uyghur uh, crisis has not been actively discussed in public, uh, you know, uh, for valid reason. People are dealing with their lives, uh, their pockets, um, their safety. So uh, I am profoundly grateful. Uh, that you are giving us this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. Thank you and good luck to your podcast. And uh, I would also like to thank you for having me here as well, giving us the opportunity. Uh, on top of everything that Nuri said, I would like to say to everyone, uh, stay hopeful for everything that is happening in your life and uh, be mindful as well. And uh, hopefully things will get better in uh, everyone's situation. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you so much again to both of you, to whoever is listening or watching this, especially to uh, Uyghurs around the world. I am so sorry that you're going through this. I am in awe of you. And there are many people out there who feel like me and we are with you and we will keep on raising awareness on what you're going through. Um, and like Samira said, and kind of Nuri, what I always say at the end of my podcast is stay well and hold tight to those you love. So thank you again. Feel free to invite your friends, subscribe, leave comments, um, and uh, stay tuned for more conversations with people from all around the globe. Um, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.